Good morning, everybody. Hope you, good, hope you had a good evening. I may be wearing sunglasses because of mine. Um, it's clearly ecosystem morning, so we're learning all about ecosystems, um, and now we're going to try and put them into perspective. Uh, I'm just going to try and give you some form of authority from my point of view um, in a kind of mini summer travel around the world, looking at hubs. I went from Bogota to Detroit to Moscow to Grenoble, back to London, Paris, etc., to find out what made, um, what made uh, a hub work and what it was. Uh, that was a couple of years ago, and I think it's moved on considerably, I think, based on what you were saying, Samma. Um, so what we're going to try and do um, is to use your thought leadership and your knowledge into um, doing stuff. So you two spoke earlier, everyone knows all about you. So we'll start off with you, Gary. Give us some perspective. This gag's going to keep going. Um, <laughs> of who you are, what you do, uh, and why you know anything about this. Absolutely. So as you can tell by my surname, I am actually Maltese. However, by the accent, you can tell I haven't really been raised here. However, I work for Tech Open Air, which is the world's sort of Europe's first ever crowdfunded technology uh, festival. We hit 20,000 people last year. We do go across the entire globe and we connect ecosystems at a more meta level. Um, so Berlin has been an interesting ecosystem and something I think Malta can learn an awful lot from in that it really didn't get much support from the government. It really didn't really have any sort of corporate sponsorship, if you like, of the ecosystem, yet somehow it grew into being one of the fastest growing ecosystems out there. And I think I touch upon in some of the comments that both of you made in earlier of your talks, it all based around the entrepreneur. And if you think about some of the talks from yesterday as well, this idea of taking on risk is ultimately what uh, we need to empower our entrepreneurs to do, because without them, you don't actually have an ecosystem. So to kind of give the Maltese flavor, which is what I think I can give to this, yeah. is I was raised and spent 15 years as a banker in London. <clears throat> I was raised wanting to do banking, wanting to do the safe job, because that's what my parents taught me to do. Now, interestingly, Malta as a nation are some of the best entrepreneurs I've ever met. Everybody either has their own business or their family have their own business, whether it's a shop on the island or a small car manufacturer or some engineer. Um, we've somehow got to be careful that we don't miss um, that drive in the Maltese sort of mindset, which is, you know, my parents emigrated to London in the 70s because they wanted a new life. They then told me to not take those same risks and take a safe job. So we need to somehow not get into that trap of getting our kids of the future to think about these more mainstream jobs and get them to want to be <clears throat> entrepreneurs and take that risk. But don't you think that's happening in most hubs or cities of the world? That this nine to five, I mean, I hate the fucking word millennial, <laughs> right? But if, to, to use millennials, yeah. I mean, the notion of travel, the, the road trip that Sammer went on, there's a lot of digital nomads and there's a lot of like, there is totally not nine to five and there's probably totally zero yeah. to zero by well, the time you're 40, you know? Yeah. If you think about it, I mean, like, if you saw my pre... Look, I've got a voice again, yay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you to the lovely lady who gave me a cough drop. <laughs> um, if you think about it, 7,500 new companies were born in London last year. And you compare that to, you know, even in 2008, it's never been more so open to be an entrepreneur. And the other thing I'd call out is Europe's attitude to failure. And I think the whole point about being an entrepreneur, um, the, the, the whole concept of failure was associated with it. And in the US, it's very simple. You fail, you pick up, you get up, you dust your hand off, you move on. And now I think people are more open-minded to it, that whole attitude to risk. The fact that the universities have entrepreneur curriculums and the fact that you have entrepreneurial company builders like Entrepreneur First, um, to me it says this is a trend that's not going to stop. It's going to absolutely carry on. Um, in your presentation, I thought it was awesome that the eight sectors that you, that you picked. And when I was going around the world, um, I remember being in um, Kenya, and they tried to brand themselves as Silicon Savannah, right? And I just I ranted for about three or four minutes saying, you know, you're completely different. You're Africa, Silicon Savannah. I mean, don't even think about branding yourself as that. Be your own, you know. And then and I never, anyone, no one's ever cheered me in my life, but everyone started going like this. It's like, great, awesome, and all that. But 
that I think we're past that silicon bog, silicon roundabout, silicon alley. I think we're, we're gone past that. Just building businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. But the, the one thing I thought was missing, no disrespect, um, apart from your voice, obviously, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, was the, the, the exit. Right? You can say what you like about Silicon Valley, but that is an exit circle. You know, the money, the company's sold, it's ploughed back into the ecosystem. How important do you think that an exit is when it comes to an ecosystem? Or do you need, I mean, I know that Sherpa, to me, sounds like a very interesting company here, that you need a fanboy, or you need like some super savior like Spotify, Stockholm, or, or something like that. I think um, exits are absolutely part of it, but also don't forget, it's... It's a 20-year cycle, right? It's a very long-term cycle. So I think we're now at the point where I, I would hope that some of the exits begin. But you're right. It is missing. It's not there yet. But we're getting companies to a scale where exits will happen. So I remain cautiously optimistic. But why is it necessarily a 20-year cycle? Who said? It's yeah. just what we've seen. I, right? I, I do disagree, though. I don't think it has to be a 20-year cycle. You do? Give, because what you mean, a generation, basically? Absolutely. Yeah. Or ultimately, if you think about uh, and why you need exits as well, is because you need people to see a poster child so that actually then the Ooh. entire ecosystem and the wider community understands why it's important to keep feeding this beast and letting it grow. But it's also VC-driven, right? So the VC business model is such that you need the exit to pay back the fund, right? And, and so a lot of that is driven through um, the kind of people that invest in the sector as well. Absolutely, but you don't necessarily have to have VC to have an exit, right? You could actually sell your company into an existing tech giant or the corporate innovation sort of plug-in that we're seeing now. So the entrepreneur exit is what drives other entrepreneurs to want to get into this and drive them to actually create new businesses. And I think, you know, you don't have to have 20 years to do that. We just need to have the right Absolutely. companies in place today. And maybe if yeah, I but see actually, it. the 20 years is about the ecosystem. It's not about the exit, yeah. right? So if you look at the, the last cycle, like um, there was an article probably about two years ago to build a good SaaS company it takes a good seven to 10 years. Yeah, that's true. You know, and so absolutely the exits are faster, but if you're gonna start a company in three years, flip it, have you really built a real business? Or have you built a feature that's gonna be swallowed up into a bigger tech corporate? So my challenge is that build a real proper sustainable business and pull an Atlassian if you have to, right? Think about it at the bitter end, but build something real. And I think, my challenge is too many people are starting a business thinking they can flip it really quickly. Yep. You know? Samma, we were talking about Malta last night or the night before uh, and having a little giggle to ourselves about, oh, yeah, right, so it's now a blockchain hub. Uh, and I've heard people say that Berlin's becoming a blockchain hub. I mean, it's a bit like saying that any city's a digital hub. It doesn't really make any sense. What do you think the challenges Malta particularly faces? Is it, is it traffic? Is it... <laughs> well, um, I mean, well, you, you said what you said to I me, you went on a seven hour bike trip, motorbike, scooter trip, and you said, this, this country is amazing. It, all of its walls are made up with collapsed edifices and old ruined kind of buildings. Maybe we can turn that into a kind of digital thing for Malta. So, I was talking about time, so let's, let's bring that back into the fold. I've noticed, and please correct me if I'm wrong, okay. In Malta, there is a Mediterranean culture, okay. And everybody knows that a Mediterranean culture means that time is always up to discussion, okay. Five minutes is five minutes or 50 minutes, you know. And I come from Lebanon, so this is not very, very, you know, uh, odd to me. However, I also experienced in the last two days um, a bit of schizophrenia in that while there is the Mediterranean concept of time, there's also a very European concept of time. And there's a continuous conflict between these two concepts. Whereas on one hand, you are preoccupied with time and being efficient, and on the other hand, you're on a fucking island in the Mediterranean, okay? Why are you in a rush? And I witnessed that at least three times in the last two days, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Are we on time, or are we not on time? So just call it the inshallah funny. effect. Yeah, yeah but, but, but it's, it's, it's exceptional because it shows you that there is an amazing, um, 
I don't know, clash of cultures here that could be an opportunity for Malta to bridge the European and uh, Mediterranean cultures, because I haven't seen this in many of the uh, countries and cities I've visited. Well, what about Be Beirut and Tel Aviv are not that dissimilar in their attractions, strategic positioning? Um, I think the similarities between Beirut and Tel Aviv are the bombs and the crazy <laughs> stuff, okay? Uh, the love and the hate. Yeah, the love and the hate. Uh, no, no, they're too far east on the Mediterranean to play that game. It has to be close to, to mainland. It has to be close to, if we're talking European. Um, I do believe Berlin has actually done that and represented that. Because if you think about the way Berlin evolved as an ecosystem, 20 years ago, there was absolutely nothing in Berlin. Nobody yeah. lived there, cheaps were rent, the artists, the creatives, or everyone from the media side of everything was just there having fun and, having, and partying. They had time. They had time to think. They had time to be um, thinking about what the future would hold. This was completely counterintuitive to the rest of Germany, and that's why the Germans actually never wanted to go to Berlin. Now, all of a sudden, the Germans are moving in because that time, with the right ingredients, has now built an ecosystem, and people have now started to professionalize. And Berlin really has only, in the last four to five years, started to see the deal flow come through because initially, it was just basically a place that people had enough time to have a lot of fun. And I think if you can yeah. bridge those two, it's quite an important But, the, um, but the, time, the, 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 the notion that time is money and all that stuff, the things that come up a lot of the times um, is how much rents go up, right? So by all accounts, renting in Malta is really expensive. London, you it, need to, to have a rich moment, moment yeah. day. And I went to Detroit about two years ago, expecting to find this eight mile, well, if you go on the other side of eight mile, you'll get, you'll get killed for five dollars, that's clear. <laughs> but I was expecting to see this, like, the area the size of San Francisco, and there's all these holes. It's not like that. It's a little scoop of building that's missed and all that. And there was a guy there, who, who um, entrepreneur who, who run Quicken Loans for cheap mortgages. He loved Detroit, so he'd brought his team of 2,000 back. He bought um, uh, an old theatre called the Madison Theatre. Madison theatre. You could only go there if you had five people. As soon as you had five people, you moved around. Madison block and they called that the Madison effect because this theater had created this type of thing and you can't get a cheap rent in Detroit you wouldn't have thought that right that's Detroit there's a waiting list for people to to, to get a decent size that so how do you get rid of that problem if you're a smart young I've gone to London I've gone to Berlin I've gone to Valletta I'm skint I've got no money and someone says, right, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month rent. How do you get over that as an ecosystem? I think, like for example, um, some of that <clears throat> in London has been not solved because London is expensive, <laughs> bar none. It's one of the most expensive cities in the world. But the whole pop-up of co-working spaces in London, I've actually lost track. Every single day, there's a new co-working space popping up, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I'm looking at it um, from a property perspective and going, how do these guys keep it running? And every single one of them is full. So I think it's a cost effectiveness of that. It's the ability to jump out of a lease really quickly because it's not a lease. And actually there's a lot of um, property companies in London where they're basically popping up old buildings saying, well, this building we're going to have to tear down, so we'll let you just use it until we tear it down. And time and time again, there's a lot of the... The original uh, origination of Silicon Roundabout was Moo.com. And Moo took out this giant cheap office space on the roundabout. And what they had were lots and lots of spare desks. And they put up a lot of other startups. So it was the ecosystem building where the entrepreneurs helped each other. And quite often, you'll see teams living in the same house or co-working in the same house. Like flat share in London is such a common thing. Absolutely. Um, and you'll see actually teams living together and working from the kitchen. So you see a lot of that kind of co-living and cohabitation, which is super common in cities like London and New York. Well, so, and interestingly, so we have a co-work space too. in Berlin yeah. as well. And yeah, one of the world's biggest co-working, WeWork, are moving into co-living as well. So yeah. there is a natural sort of connection to trying to resolve the issues around rent and how can you, you know, by, by laws of numbers, yeah. actually achieve a lower rent by being a, a group of people. And, and there's a whole like, thing like popping up called property tech in places like London to address these kind of issues. So. Okay, so... Can I ask you a question before you... Yeah, but... Yeah. In your trips around... Let's just keep the US yeah. out of it for now. 
the trip across um, Europe, these 31 cities, did the, notion, did the idea of rent come up in those conversations? The idea of what? The idea of rent. rent. It's, really, it's really expensive to rent. I wouldn't have I thought think so. I think, honest, I, I'm, I, my perspective on, on reality has shifted so much in the last six <laughs> months, so I really don't know how to answer. Like, I'm, I'm listening to two very valid arguments, okay, from both sides of, of this panel, but at the same time, if we are going to look at it from the perspective of Malta, um, and if we're going to look at it from the perspective of literally anything that's not London or Berlin or Paris, or the world is moving incrementally more towards these non-intensively uh, overwhelming, uh, dense urban centers. Okay, uh, people are beginning to go back to living outside of the urban centers. Not necessarily as we, not necessarily in the next 10 to 20 years, but in the way that, in the way that I've seen it, people are looking for quality of life as a priority, and they are starting to look for it outside of the densest and the most lucrative of the destinations. And I saw a lot of that in Spain, I saw a lot of that in Portugal, I saw a lot of that in France. Uh, in France, where Paris is literally the only major city, okay, there's a massive redistribution of that intellectual capital across other cities, where people look to seek for a better life. Okay. Now, is rent a problem? Yes, rent is a problem, but do you really need to be in Paris or London or Berlin to create anything today? You have to be in a big, uh, you have to be in a big city yeah, at arguably, least once a week, yeah. even if you live in the beautiful, I mean, I live in the South Downs, but if I didn't come to my club in London on Soho on a Wednesday to get 10 or 15 people together, I would go absolutely fucking mental. But, yeah, but also arguably... You know what I mean? You, you need to have the city to, to keep it together. Yeah, but arguably but as well... that's because you've been conditioned. But some are, are the best companies being found in these places that you've explored? Probably not. Honestly, Probably in every not. city I went to, there has been an exit. No matter but how for peripheral what, how much? it is. 10, 15 million? It doesn't matter. We want exits. Guys, and, guys, know, like... an exit. If I'm living in Bratislava, okay, most of you don't know where Bratislava is. Maybe you I've don't know it's where it's <laughs> from a movie, you know, vampires and stuff. But anyway, if, if, you, if I live in Bratislava and the average wage there is 600 euros a month, and I exit my company for 20 million euros, okay, that's fine. Because for me, I did well. I live in a community that I like, my family's around me, my friends are around me, and I will live like a king for the rest of my days. It's all relative. If I live in San Francisco and I exit for 100 million, I'm poor. Okay, like I was, I was reading this thing about how in Shenzhen, exit, uh, a millionaire is, is now poor. You have to have at least 100 million to, but you know what, Summer? to be rich. You know what, Summer, I think the, the interesting thing is when I land in places like Silicon Valley, and I, I know Tuche can probably um, confirm this, but they don't really care about us in Europe. They really don't. They're like, oh, that's so cute. You've had a 20 million exit. You're not really dreaming big. You're not thinking big enough. So the other thing is, what is big enough an exit for us in Europe? How ambitious are we really in Europe? Even the thing they think about our London-based companies, and we're one of the biggest in the world, they don't think we're ambitious enough. And I know we don't want to get into the Silicon Valley versus Europe argument, but the reality is this innovation ecosystem and what's driven it has been a lot of the thinking from the West Coast. So I respect your arguments, but we have to think about what's good for the overall ecosystem and what's good for all of Europe. So, so I think we to, need to be more ambitious. We so have to be. Just to counter to that, and I totally agree with you, and let's talk about Europe as a main ecosystem here. I do think what the, the fundamental shift will be is that finally the industry that Europe actually represents is finally jumping on board. So think about Daimler, who is one of my sort of big clients that I work with. They will be taking the driverless car in the next five years. Absolutely. It won't come from Google because they don't own the supply chain. So one, I believe that's where you're gonna see this emergence of Europe starting to actually surpass the US because now it's starting to be embedded into our everyday lives and into the actual industries that are pre-existing. No, and, I, and I go yeah, again I with totally the Silicon Valley key, they yeah. don't care about us. I mean, I don't really give a fuck about them. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> People are starting well, to Well, we should. That's well, where the money is well, coming from. Well, they're throwing price. rocks at the Google bus, you know. <laughs> They'll be shooting guns at the Google bus, too. Um, so that, that preoccupation, it's not, you know, it's like, it's just a bit, it's a bit 
a bit daft. You know, I, don't, I don't really understand, understand why that matters. But, but Sammy, you said you were looking for a European ecosystem in your travels. Yeah. That was very utopian of you, right? Not you, at all. You don't think so? No. I, an ecosystem is basically, biologically speaking, is in a, a space or a, an environment where different entities have different roles and they all work together to create a balanced ecosystem, a balanced environment. And they may feed off of each other, they may, but it, there's a balance, there's a harmony. And I traveled through 40 different cities plus, 15 countries across sometimes Shenzhen zones and so, Schengen zones and so on. And it was in harmony. There was harmony. And the harmony is based on two things. One, a general agreement on some laws, okay, that allow you to move freely and do business freely. But more so, there's harmony in the people in Europe. And I, I have a very hard time explaining that because I think Europeans take it for granted. But they're starting to stop, to not take it for granted because of the influx of the non-harmonious migrants into Europe. They're starting to realize that there is, there is a scenario that, there, that doesn't involve harmony. In Europe, there's a value system that was built from a lot of trial and error. You want people who have failed repeatedly? The Europeans, okay? <laughs> 5,000 years of continuous war, okay? And then they're like, guys, let's take a break, okay? And when they took this break, they established a value system that allowed them to function in a relatively meaningful way because I'm not going to screw you just because I want to make an extra dollar. That's not part of the value system, okay? I'm not going to backstab you. I'm not going... There is a general humane value system that we all agree to. And as a result, there is a contiguous ecosystem. Now, does it mean there's going to be a hub? Is everyone working together? No. But... I was literally able to drive from city to city and do business simply based on the contacts that I established in the city before that. And with a dog. And with a dog. Dude. You know, like <laughs> zero effort on my part and it was very seamless, very natural, full of flow. But here's a question. Does Harmony create a billion dollar company? Here's another question. There you go. That's a Cheryl, question. No, no, I, I have to put this out there. Cheryl Sandberg said, I don't know if it's in a book or in a video or something. And she was very proud of it. She's like, I spend, I make 20 minutes a day for my newborn child. I make that commitment. And I'm like, you are a horrible mother. Okay. <laughs> Fuck, man. Who, who do you think you are to say that and be proud of it and encourage anyone? Fathers should put more than 20 minutes a day. Mothers? And I don't think, if, if, we're, if you're going to set out to create a billion dollar company, you're doing it wrong. If you create a billion dollar company in the process of building something extraordinary, I think, I think it doesn't matter where you are. Look at Skype, that originated yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Okay, look at Rovio, look at, I mean, Monty can tell us all don't about Rovio. Don't tell me about Rovio, <laughs> I can't even tell you. Billion dollar companies can come from anywhere. Yeah. The focus on the values is what makes it worthwhile the journey. Well, like I think it's Sa a combination of the two, though, Samar. Like Samar, I'm putting 20 minutes into this panel, and if I put 22 minutes into it, I'm going to miss my <laughs> flight. So, uh, last thoughts, what can Malta do inside, outside Maltese? What do you think? Uh, keep doing what you're doing. It's a great start, but just do a lot more of it. And connect the community. So, that my dad needs to know that he needs to get into a car that's a shared driving car to drive. He won't do it because of his mindset. If we can focus on trying to change the local community to embrace the great things that you're all creating, it will help the ecosystem tremendously. Digital nomad retired Sama. I think Malta needs to rebrand. Uh, I didn't know anything about Malta before I came here. I think there's a massive opportunity. There needs to be a very strong effort at doing an event like this on an international scale. 20, 30,000, 40,000 people. Enough flights come in, you have more than enough of beautiful reasons to come here, good food, good weather. You don't need to sell it much more than that. Awesome, still delivers a good presentation even when she loses her voice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll never live that down. I think for the, the, the crew in Malta, it's about focus. And find out what you're really, 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 really good at and go deep. So the observations that I've met, I've had over the last two nights talking to a lot of folk from around here, focus on blockchain, focus on fintech, focus on being really punchy about a regulatory environment 
and be so good at it, you can become world class. And people will take notice. Do what you did in gaming, but with certain technologies. Great. Well, listen, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you have uh, to my panel. Thank you very much.